Okay, I want to do warm-up exercises with everyone because we just had lunch, but I'm not going to embarrass everybody. So um, welcome to openatrium.edu, um, using Open Atrium as a campus intranet. I'm Kevin Miller from Cal State Monterey Bay, the uh, little second youngest Monterey uh, C CSU campus, so Cal State System campus. Um, And I just threw this slide in because I just learned this about an hour ago, but we uh, just did a lot of research. So if you're interested on how you name your portal, we found that out of 2,000 so portals we found on campuses, because Educause lets you search their entire DNS, um, most people call it my something. All right, so a brief history of um, CSUMB, what we did in the past and how we got to the point of using Open Atrium. Um, actually, before I begin, let's just get a feel of the room. How many of you know what Open Atrium is? Okay. How many of you have used Open Atrium? Okay. How many of you have installed Open Atrium? Okay. How many of you like how you can add the how many like how many of you like the dashboard editing experience in Open Atrium? Okay. Um, so uh, Cal State Monterey Bay, this is uh, just a brief overview. So we're a young campus. We have a central IT, so our IT, our web team is myself as web developer, Greg Poole, who's in the front here, who's our lead, and we have a, um, uh, an, a, another employee, Isaac, who works from Portland and who does a lot of administrative stuff. So we're a really small team. Um, and we really started with uh, a portal on our campus using a product called ViewPortal, um, which I know a lot of campuses use. Um, we could never really get it successfully off the ground. ViewPortal is a Java, Java environment, I think. Yeah, so um, it requires that expertise and we didn't have it on our campus. And it was just kind of ugly and it didn't really work. We deployed it for our, internally for our IT department, um, but we never rolled it out to the rest of the campus. Um, however, we then were, we were faced with a few things, a few big changes on our campus. First of all, we were switching from first class, uh, which I still have weird memories of, um, to Google Apps for education for all of our email and things like that. At the same time, we were also switching student information systems from Banner to PeopleSoft. And so um, we had to have a place for people to start to get their email on the web, to use CAS to authenticate so they can authenticate once into some place and then go off to email, to student information system, et cetera. Um, and so we, it was clear that we needed a portal. And at the time, we had kind of a Skunk Works project going on, making a portal at the time in Drupal 5 using, um, I can't remember the name of the, uh, the pre predecessor to Homebox. I think it was like Start Page or something like that. And uh, um, a bunch of iframes. So. Um, it was iframes into little applications that were uh, accessing information. And so we deployed that on our campus. Um, we ran it for about two years. It was pretty successful, but it didn't have a lot of flexibility and we only spent like a month on it. Um, so we did a lot of user testing. We did all, everything we didn't do in the beginning and did actual user testing, usability studies, sitting down with students, did a big survey and upgraded it. Um, uh, to using uh, Open Atrium. And the reason we did chose that as our team, and I think other campuses should think about as well, um, when faced with using Drupal natively or Open Atrium as a uh, um, intranet, is that Open Atrium gives, gave us a whole lot of um, uh, things out of the box so we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. So the, the, again, the first thing, big thing that was driving people to using the portal was, was Google. Um, it was also our student information system. That's my feeling about it. So um, portals on a campus usually um, are started by a single client um, who has a big voice about what they want um, and not, not necessarily all the time, but almost all RFQs, RFPs by higher ed never have usability, user experience, or just being plain pretty to look at as uh, requirements. Um, so 
and I apologize in advance if you, any of you are at these universities, but I'm just gonna quickly um, show you some portals. So you'll start seeing like a, a pattern. I could go really, really fast on that. So the portal, it's basically a lot of boxes with stuff in it. It's not very dynamic. Somebody's is down, apparently. Um, you know, like, oh, whoops, CNN. Um, I like this one, browser alert, I'm using Chrome. Um, and I don't even, it's like Chrome One. Um, so portals, oftentimes it's one person who's like the dean of students or the registrar or whatever, and they're like, I want a place that's basically the, the just my little stuff, and uh, that's all I want. Um, so, what ends up happening is portals just become a collection of portlets, um, which is a lot of portal systems call them portlets, which is basically um, either iframes into other enterprise systems. They don't like really integrate very well with the interface, and a lot of times the portals are like you saw with like some of the, the CNN example, et cetera like jar with the rest of the page layout. And ultimately it just makes it really un, un, not very beautiful to look at. Um, you also are faced with a lot of integration with the student information system. Um, so dealing with that with other, so you have like your proprietary, I don't know if anyone likes their student information system, but you have the, your proprietary SIS usually with its own little way of working with other systems. And then you have this proprietary portal. And unless it's like something like PeopleSoft portal, which is the SIS and the portal at the same time, but then you're st stuck in PeopleSoft land, um, getting it to integrate with a portal is very difficult. Um, and so we found by, uh, I'll go over the tricks we use, by using a few tricks to expose our student information system in a restful sort of web standard way, um, we were then able to be like, ah, Drupal, is totally good, we can use feeds, we can use you know standard REST environment to get all that data. You're also faced with most campuses that the portal becomes a committee project. Um, so I, I, I name these guys, I wanted my stuff via homepage in. Um, Cause that's typically what happens in a, in a sort of standard committee environment is people are like, I just want my thing um, on the dashboard and you can't customize it. What we heard from our students in our first iteration of portal before we moved to Open Atrium, half of the screen was customizable by them, the other half wasn't. And we heard loud and clear from students, the number one thing, well the number one thing they wanted was that the portal at the time was ugly and they wanted it to be pretty. Number two thing was I wanna be able to change the colors. And number three was I don't like all the crap from the registrar on the left hand side. I, you know, they've emailed me 12 times about it. I just, I wanna have complete control. Um, so, registering th those requirements for, uh, as identified from the user and, and having that drive with the committee that owns the portal is probably very difficult on most campuses. On our campuses, luck campus luckily we're small, we don't have that kind of problem. And typically, again, most portal implementations have a vendor involved and um, a vendor-based solutions that, that are oftentimes difficult to integrate. So. Open Atrium, uh, and I'm just gonna have a few more slides and then actually show you the things we've done with Open Atrium. So um, again, we used, chose Open Atrium because it got us 90% of the way there. It came with a dashboard, it came with um, organic groups, which our prior version was already using organic groups to replace functionality that wasn't in Google Apps, but we had in our old first class system, um, which was the ability for people to have communications. So um, we were like, Open Atrium gets us 90% of the way there. We quickly found out, however, that there's a whole lot of things in Open Atrium because it just kind of comes with everything. Um, we had to either turn off or tweak um, in order to for it to actually work as a, a normal campus would expect it to work. Um, and also, so we had a lot of challenges, things like on everybody's campus, you authenticate with an ID. That ID is not your real name, that ID is you know, um, you don't walk up to people, and this is not my ID, because I'm not that dumb to show that, but um, you don't walk up to people and say, hey, my name is Mill3828, and so Open Atrium shouldn't 
Uh, normally with most things like CAS or LDAP authentication, in Drupal it just sets the username as the authentication name. So we used the real name module, um, which allows you to um, do a theme override of usernames. So um, it can be any other field. So we have a field in their, in their content profile for first name, field for last name. Those are set by our, um, our LDAP server when a user logs in. Um, but the problem is if you have a module like, um, I'm sorry, this Denver altitude's like destroyed my usually supple soft jazz voice. But so I'll be drinking water every once in a while. Um, how do people live at this altitude? So, so modules uh, that I they they'll rename uh, be named anonymous, but it's uh, it's um, it, well, it's it's a uh, case tracker. Um, modules like case tracker and open atrium actually don't appropriately theme the username before outputting it. It just literally puts in user the uh, name parameter of the user. Um, so we had to override a ton of forms and a ton of views, um, expose filters in order to actually show a person's real name um, and make those things uh, behave appropriately. So um, we actually just committed a module two days ago called Atrium Real Name. We put it in the Atrium um, uh, Features group. I'll show that to you later. Um, so we're starting to commit some of this stuff into Contrib. So right now you can't actually download Atrium Real Name. It's basically a huge collection of form overrides and things like that. Um, Open Atrium, because it uses con uh, spaces dashboard, um, basically there's a dashboard context for every type of space, which can be site-wide, user, or in a group. Um, the problem is this, by default, it's kind of like the default dashboard. The, our, our users don't need that many dashboards. They just want their homepage, that's their customizable dashboard, which normally is their, their user dashboard. Um, they don't care about the other site-wide context dashboard, which is the one that's usually just set by an administrator. So we had to, and we're almost done with taking our stuff and making it contrib ready um, to commit an atrium home module that basically lets you get a home button because we found a lot of times in testing users when they were in a group when you click on dashboard that was the dashboard in that group not your own dashboard and they were like it's the same icon and it doesn't make any sense and so that was a very it, it was seemed like a simple fix but because of the way spaces works um, ended up being more complicated. Um, we also, in our prior instance, uh, our, uh, our prior portal, where we had organic groups, um, there were, because there was no interest in, on the part of anybody to uh, kind of vet groups, because we didn't want to be in the position of saying, you, you're not a group, you, you don't, you know, you're legalized marijuana, group doesn't get to you know, have a right to exist. What happened was we just let people make as many groups as they wanted and those groups could be public or private um, or controlled um, and it caused a big problem because we ended up with like 2,700 groups within the first year. That 2,700 public groups and then four or 5,000 private groups that people were creating to, to do things like manage a shared class project or something which is fine but the, we had set too many public groups, so it caused a problem where people were like, which legalized marijuana group should I join, or what, what have you. So we needed to introduce a way in Atrium to restrict users to only being able to create private groups, and then we just had a simple Google Doc form that they could fill out to say, hey, could you make my group available? And all we do is make sure you're not duplicating existing uh, group functionality. So, and I'll get back to this slide later, but there's some more stuff to share with you about um, uh, later to learn more about Open Atrium. So now I'm gonna jump into the demo and hope that the Wi-Fi works. Um, so first I'm gonna show you our portal. So, oh my God, I have a hole. So the first one, another great functionality that we added to um, Open Atrium, I'm gonna go full screen here. Um, 
is we use the private message module. So I, every time I kind of go over a feature, I'll go over how we, with the recipe basically of how we did this. So um, in Open Atrium, this guy right here is called the uh, palette. So any block that you set in the palette region will be displayed as a modal dialog. Um, we added some additional functionality for basically um, create opening those in, uh, automatically when the user views a page and add a, an overlay div that makes it dark gray. Um, so those are the only two things we added and we'll be contributing those back as soon as we can. Um, but this is a block that shows um, we're using private message module and private message tag module. So we have um, basically a view of a user's messages tagged as um, important. Um, what that allows us to do is send like a message to all students, a message to all faculty, because you can use, use bulk operations with private message. So you can send a message to all users of a role. Um, sometimes we get a list of um, IDs from our student information folks saying, hey, could you send this message to students like saying, you have a hold, you have to do, you know, deal with this promptly. And the nice thing about these messages is this appears right when you log in, you can't even get to your email, so it's even more jarring than like yet another email in your in inbox, and they really stand out. Um, so we just use private message, private message tags and views in order to do this. Um, so that way the, the view of your um, unread messages, of your unread urgent messages is in the palette region, um, and if it's empty, then it doesn't display. So I'm gonna close that. The other thing you'll notice is I have pretty flowers on my dashboard. Um, so we've created a, where's my theme? Okay. We created a way to create um, uh, basically it's sub-themes of the Geek Ginkgo theme, um, but we, we've created one called Photoizer, which is basically a sub-theme of the Ginkgo theme with some a custom node type so that our folks in our marketing department can upload photographs. So we created a theme called Watershed because we have a Watershed Institute. It's right across the street from our office um, where they have a lot of native plants. So every time you, know, you load the page slowly over the Wi-Fi, you get a different picture about the watershed, or we have one about history of Monterey called Sepia, and, it, and we, you can click and see the big picture. Um, we can add uh, like a caption, so cypress trees of Monterey or what have you. Um, we're actually working on making one for like athletics, et cetera. Uh, we have some fun ones. This is a nice, it's called candy. Um, we even, I'm gonna just attempt flowerless here. Um, created this one, this is fun. So this was our number one most requested feature was I want, I want to be able to customize my dashboard. And so this is like, you can click on the clouds and they disappear. And the sun comes up. If you click on six of them, you can play Pong. So um, that was the mo most commented on feature. I'm gonna go back to the watershed because it's pretty. So those are basic sub-themes of Ginkgo. Almost all of them are just um, CSS. You know, it's just create a new folder, put in some nice CSS. You can give your users a ton of options. Another um, feature that we added um, is what we call links. So. There's a lot of, in a lot of campuses, you have a ton of enterprise resources that may or may not integrate with anything, um, and you need to provide simple links to get to those. The problem is that users um, wanna be able to control those because different types of people have different needs. So users get by default a, a, a list of links um, which they can add to their dashboard as an app if they want, or it's always available up here in the links menu. Um, and these are just links off to other resources. I can customize the list. So I can add new other links. So if I worked for our corporation, 
I'd add maybe timekeeping and training. Um, if I use Blogger a lot, I could add Blogger. Um, these are only campus resources. We did have people say like, I want, you know, Pandora or whatever, and we were like, no, because then that gets in a slippery slope. But basically, we uh, create a link to any campus resource broken down by who you might be. And you can add, add them from here to here. You can drag them around and put them in order, et cetera. And we'll be expo writing that as a, a feature pretty soon. Um, we also created um, a group called Campus News and Events, which is um, just a private group where a privileged few can p make posts. Because e now that users are able to customize their dashboard to whatever they want, we do need a way to kind of communicate to them that's not like a big ah, alert pop-up box, but just like a, here's what's going on on campus. And so we just, all we did was create a private group called Campus News and Events. Um, and we made a view of those, of posts in that group. Um, and then just stick it on the top of the dashboard so they can see that our student information system is down as of today. Um, these actually get a lot of reads. Um, so these, on average, between six or 800, which is pretty good for a campus of about 4,000 students. Um, and you can see here, there's the, this is the home module in action. I don't have a dashboard tab. I only have a dashboard tab if I'm in a group that I'm a member of. So right now in, in Open Atrium, if you install it, let me just go to my, Chrome has like 500 tabs open, so it's probably unhappy. When you install Open Atrium by default, it uses the context UI um, uh, tool to allow you to customize the dashboard. When you do that, it creates a lot of usability problems because it, this thing floats over the blocks that you're trying to move. It's really annoying, and none of our users liked it. It made no sense whatsoever. Um, so what we did instead was just use a little bit of JavaScript and a little CSS to say when you click it, slide it over from the left-hand side. Um, we also, um, this is actually just you know, JavaScript override on a form, so there's some hidden radio buttons that are clicked when you select the layout. Open Atrium by default comes with three layouts, and their names mean nothing. So we made a little picture of three columns, has three columns, two split columns is they're equal, and a default is like a wide and a, and a narrow, and I can change them. We had to warn them to change layouts, so every time they make a change, it turns it red, um, and it's the basic stuff here. We also had to, um, when you use Open Atrium by default, all of the categories of applications is by the, is created by the module exposing them. So if you make a lot of blocks and share them on your dashboard um, using views, for example, then it'll be like views as the category. And that means nothing to the user, and we don't want them to see the word atrium at all, because even though it's a pretty word, um, they don't need to know that. And so um, we just use, we wrote a module again coming out in Contrib soon to just um, reorder apps into categories like campus information, you know, um, my information, et cetera. Um, so that's uh, make another little usability enhancement. And I'm going to drink my water. Because we touch a lot of enterprise resources that may or may not be available at any given moment um, or uh, may be down, um, we don't want to uh, just use standard um, Drupal blocks to um, expose that information because it might slow down the page load time. So um, we used a module called a um, Ajax Blocks, which lets you basically do this. You'll see when I load my dashboard, all the blocks load by Ajax. The nice thing, it's using appro appropriate ARIA roles here, so it is, it is nicely accessible and injecting in the DOM correctly. So for example, our campus dining app, which is basically just a different view of a um, Google uh, calendar, um, 
is, can load on, on its own time because the Google Calendar API might be really slow. Um, we also introduced, and, and I'll show you how to do this um, towards the end, um, in Atrium it's in spaces in general, it's relatively easy to create new custom spaces. Um, so for example, every um, role, every major role on campus like faculty, staff, students, I'll have a, um, a space that's just for them. Um, and that's where we do things like put applications that we want them to be able to access, but they may or may not remove off their dashboard because they're like, I don't care about you know, my list of classes, but they know they can always get to it in their students tab. So in faculty and staff, um, I can see my employee ID, which I can share with the world because it doesn't really do anything. I can see my major. Um, I can see, remember the links that I showed earlier, the links that appear here, when you go to customize them, it shows a list of the links in, uh, available to you. We also put those links in the tab um, for each major role. So I only see links here that are either campus related or are just related to my um, particular role, which is great because I may, you know, only want to know use uh, Hyperion or whatever um, every once in a while and not want to add it to my links. Um, and I can see, you know, posts in a staff and faculty group. And in a minute, I'll show you the student view, which is different. And actually, let's go do that right now. So, and th these are real students and applicants, but I changed their names. Um, uh, and I did it using the inspector in Google Chrome. So I'm not going to click around, because then you would see their name. But I wanted to show you um, some different experiences for our portal. So students, staff, faculty, and active alumni all get the same experience. Um, it's pretty much uh, what I showed you. They can join and create groups, et cetera. Um, the only people who can't do that are applicants. Um, so we have 14, sorry, 16 to 17,000 applicants um, every semester. Um, and they are all automatically provisioned an account with the campus because they need to be able to log in and see what their status is, et cetera. But the problem is um, uh, CMS PeopleSoft uh, doesn't really, when you log in, it's an empty screen. It doesn't really show you what your status is. And when you get there, the messages are very confusing and, and make no sense. So again, and this actually you can see, we have a different um, uh, palette that we've constructed here that says, oh, you forgot to set up your forgot password questions. Um, so we also have, again, just using standard Drupal blocks and putting them in the palette depending on what's going on with the user. We have one that says, like, you haven't registered for emergency alerts. Type in your, your phone number so you're registered. And it, these blocks are so annoying as people log in, they actually pay attention to them pretty quickly. I'm just going to close that. So here's Addy applicant. So the applicants have a different dashboard and different items that are available to them. And you can see here's their checklist which most applicants, they just want to log in to see, you know, did you get everything? Um, and I can see uh, messages, and these are messages that are customized um, based on what's going up on with their application at that time. So the idea is they can log in and it's like, hey, you're conditional admit, here's what you need to do, you have some things you have to fill out, et cetera. Um, so our, and I'll show you in a, in a bit, our admissions team, are, we're basically using ru the rules module and a custom rules filter um, to let them have a UI that's like, if the applicant has this status and this reason and they're applying in the spring semester, show this message. Or if they have this checklist item that they haven't completed um, and it's due in six, six weeks and it's a Sunday and we're wearing red boxer shorts, show them this other checklist item. Um, so it's nice and, and very flexible. As a student, here's Sarah's student. Um, this is a real student's dashboard. Um, so she's added, for example, we're using uh, Drupal's, it comes with Open Atrium, the feeds module to suck over some RSS feeds from our campus website. Um, so that was very easy to make a view of all um, feeds items that you've, a user's flagged. Um, so when, I can't click on that because I'm not logged in, I'll show you in a bit, but we've, we've used, okay, feeds to bring over the data, we've used to expose that as a block, um, and then let the user uh, flag the feed. 
so they can flag, you know, I want to subscribe to campus news, to information technology news, et cetera. So using views and, and flag, um, you can let users subscribe to different feed nodes um, and then just populate a list of their customized news. Um, so we can see she's a, a member of several groups. We have the weather and a calendar. We have our class schedule, um, which is by default on, on the top of the user's dashboard. Um, it's great for new students especially because they can go, they can see you know, the room that it's in, um, and then you know, there's the map where it's at. Um, and also we have a, a, an iLearn, uh, which is what we, call Mo it's what we call Moodle on our campus. So, sorry, we call Moodle iLearn on our campus. Uh, so we used iLearn's API to show the user a quick link straight to their iLearn course. Um, and that's one of the most heavily used features in my. And when our student clicks the student tab, you can see we have some things that were there already, like her class schedule, because she may have removed it off her dashboard. Um, but we also show her links to, for example, our ASAP folks, which is, um, I have no idea what ASAP stands for, but it's their advising, um, our advising group who now accept submissions via Google Docs and leave notes on it and send it back to the person. Um, so there's some extra student services that are available in the student tab, which is actually the third most trafficked web page on our entire campus. So they use it a lot. Um, they also have links to forms, which is a different system I won't go into. It's not Drupal or anything. And then they get their student links. So that's a different set of links than, uh, than what staff see. You can see, and I'm gonna click on this, this is gonna be very long, because um, we're doing network maintenance. Um, so we also using feeds. Um, a lot of campuses have an IT infrastructure uh, that exposes system status or alerts about what's going on on campus. Uh, we have the same thing, and since it's spring break, we're just unplugging everybody's network and redoing everything, so we have a lot of alerts. Um, but using this uh, region up here is called the uh, space tools, and you can use context to set a space tool block in that region. So this is just a, uh, a view of alert items created in a feed that were, um, the start and end time is between, it, falls around now. Um, so you can just use context to place a view into the spaces region and you'll automatically get a nice little list. That's the same thing that links is. So links is just a view of all flagged link nodes. Um, you just drop it in the spaces, use some CSS to add a cute little icon and you're done. So for um, for groups, we did have to construct our own group space, very similar to how you construct st students, staff, and faculty space, um, because the default organic groups view is nice, but it doesn't work when you have a ton of groups. Um, so it's relatively straightforward to make a different kinds of views for the list of a user's groups, um, and then just create a different custom space. So this space is slash groups as opposed to slash OG, which is the organic groups view. Um, so we can do things like place a block, letting us users know how to create a group, um, allow people to view groups by categories, um, and even show like recent posts in our news and events. Another feature that a lot of people use to discover groups is we're using um, this cool module called radioactivity. Um, radioactivity lets you weight content by a wide variety of, ca uh, of, of requirements. So you can say, you know, content that's basically what we, we, we call this on, around campus is um, what's hot, what's going on on campus right now. So this is posts on any public group um, that has the most reads or the most comments, et cetera. So radioactivity lets you add basically energy to a node so if a person views it, it gets a little bit of energy. If they comment on it, it gets more energy. Um, and then you set a half-life so that it gets energy, but then after a day it gets, get cut, gets cut in half. So you don't have like the most common node from 12 years ago on the top. So a lot of users use this to look at what's going on in different groups.
there's also an excellent module out there called um, Atrium Gantt Chart, um, which when, and the, I'm in a really low resolution, so things are running over. Um, so we did install uh, the ideation module, which allows you to create ideas and filter ideas. Um, no one's put an idea in this group, I thought they did. Um, so it's a basically a way to collect ideas about a project. So we're doing an upgrade to a system on campus. Our users can put in information uh, about like, I'd like to see this great feature, um, and people can vote on it. And that's a module that's available right now. We didn't write it, somebody else did. Um, you can install it and it turns that feature on automatically. Um, but you can use Gantt chart to make Gantt charts on cases. Um, so this is basically gives you like a planner view. So I don't like Gantt charts, but some managers just like freak out when they see that. So um, there's a, a module called JS Gantt in Drupal.org that lets you create Gantt chart views basically. So it gives you a different display uh, for your views. Um, and that renders them out in, in pretty little Gantt charts, uh, which does impress certain types of people. Um, oh, and you may have noticed, are you online, Greg? So we, how many of you have heard of Olark? Okay, I'm gonna do a quick like plug for a company that we love, um, and not just because it gave us a t-shirt. Um, so, Olark is basically, um, when we rolled out MyCSUMB at the end of last summer, um, we knew we'd have a lot of support questions. We'd trained user, not trained, but we had prepared them for the move, but we uh, knew that there'd be a lot of issues and questions. Um, so, what we did was we purchased a, a plan with Olark, that's O-L-A-R-K, um, and it basically, there's a, a module written by the Lullabot folks um, that lets you set an uh, OLARC code on a page um, based on context or rules. Um, so for example, I can go in and at any time say, oh, you know, I can read the FAQ, or I can say, help, I need help. And it gives us live chat. The nice thing is, um, it works with Jabber, so you can use any Jabber client. Uh, we can also do things like set custom values for the user in the Jabber client. So for example, if I view a user who's chatting with me um, for, with a support question, I can see their name, their, their campus ID if I need to look something up about them. I can see their role, so I can see if they're a student, staff, faculty. And the, the OLARC API allows you to add very easily any additional attributes you need from the backend system. Um, I can even, do you want to show them C? So if, let's say for example I say, how, how do I get home? This is one of those demo things that like doesn't work half the time. Are you in there? So with Olark, you can initiate commands. So you can say, push a user to a different URL, or um, uh, what we're trying to attempt here, um, which you can say, bang C, and it lets you see what the person sees in their browser, um, and circle items on the screen. So there's Greg's putting circle on the page, which is, we usually ask people's permission before the, we do this, because it freaks them out, but it's really nice, because a lot of times students are like, how do I find my student ID? And we're like, oh, click on student, and here it is, and they're like, oh, great. I can't believe I missed it. So um, we really love Olark and, and highly suggest it. We're actually gonna start rolling this out to our student support people in general, so students can go on and say, where's my financial aid? Why can't I get into this class, et cetera. Um, So, yeah, at this point, I'm click, I, oh, I can click to remove them, wow. Sorry, I just discovered a new feature. So some things that we're working on right now, um, even this is a nice improved user experience interface, but it's not accessible. Um, and actually, we, we were presenting on this project at Stanford and a, a fellow, John Folo, 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 Folio, 
I got it wrong both times. Um, he, he was really big on accessibility. He was standing back there watching me, and he's like, put his hand up and like, John, you're gonna ask about accessibility and no, this is not accessible at all. You cannot move boxes using the keyboard and it sucks and he just kind of nodded. He's like, is that accessible? No. So uh, very, we actually have a patch in spaces, uh, in the spaces issue queue as of Monday um, to fix this and the way that we're proposing to fix it is that in the context UI, you can get an alternate version which is essentially exactly like the administrative block interface that you are all know and love, but is nice and accessible because it has off-screen but readable weight values and everything's labeled properly. User, it's, it's even more uh, useful for people with cognitive disabilities who might be able to see but have problems placing boxes in exactly the right place. Um, so we're, we're hoping this will get put into spaces dashboard, if not, we'll put out another module to enable this. Um, and at this point, I think we're pretty much, oh, so yes, code. And uh, on our website, uh, the website for this talk, which is, again, csumb.edu slash Drupal, you'll see on the bottom of the page a link to um, resources for this talk. We have a link to a, a GitHub GIST with this code. Um, but this is also available on the uh, Atrium community site. So for example, we wanted to uh, let users do this, like go off their profile and click change theme, which this isn't available by default. Um, and also we were using the cast module, which uses a different logout URL. Um, so there's a nice handy hook called a account links alter, which basically passes a links array and you can add, you know, here we're adding change theme as the thir fourth item on the list. So it's a very simple alter hook. Um, we do have some blocks on our dashboard that we don't want available to users. So for example, as an administrator, I can, you know, look at, you run a test applicant checklist. So if an applicant asks me a question about their checklist, I can put in their ID and see what they see. We don't want that available, of course, and we, we also have things that do other administrative services. Um, so you can use um, a hook dashboard block access alter, which is a spaces hook that allows you to go through the list of blocks that are available for that space and unset them based on whatever you want, user permissions, et cetera. Um, we actually wrote our own custom UI form to let us say this block is available to these three roles. Um, and once we get it un unconnected from all this other stuff we wrote around it, we'll, we'll try to commit it. Um, Atrium by default comes with some standard blocks like the welcome video block um, that shouldn't be in things like the dashboard for groups, um, which we don't let users edit their group dashboard just because Again, for them, they were like, it's, I can edit this one and which one's mine, and it was too confusing. So we just made use a standard uh, dashboard for every group. So using spaces preset alter, you can, um, for example, here, remove the annoying atrium welcome member block. So this is how um, we define things like the student space or the group space, et cetera, which by default, right, for, for some of these, they're blank pages and they're just all blocks set by context. So they don't, they're not actually returning any data, although you could do that. Um, so you def use hook menu to define your URL. So if here's a student URL and we're putting it in the, in the features menu, which puts it up top in the, in the buttons. Um, and you, in this example, we're just using a, a simple permission to say, you know, students can access a student page, but staff can't. Um, and then there's a simple menu callback that checks to see if um, the space exists at all in context, and if not, it creates it on the fly. Um, and then, so when you enable this module, go there, it'll be empty, but then you can go into, you'll see in context um, this space available, and you can then add blocks however you want. 
and that's pretty much it. I think we're open to questions now. If you have questions, please go to the microphone. Or I could do a little dance. Question for you. Can you hear me? I barely, but yeah. Hi. I have a question about search, um, especially when you have the real name and the username. Can students search each other by name, or how does it work? We're actually using um, a Apache Solar for search. Um, we use it for all of our products. So we're actually, there's a module called Atrium Apache Solar um, that changes this form basically to submit to, to um, Apache Solar as opposed to the default search module. Um, we're also, we also, um, are you circling my screen again? So, so we also wrote a view, and it, there is a little bug here with the pager that I still haven't looked at. So by default, a Apache Solar um, Atrium gives you, you know, standard search results, um, filter by group, uh, and you can see, you know, some of Greg's posts came up towards the top, but we also made just a, a view block that um, took this argument up here and did a search and displayed it as a list of users, um, which is great because we can filter out users like applicants, which people shouldn't see, so. Where's the code for this? Um, because I'd like to replace that screenshot you did of Penn State, which I'm from Penn State, um, and I keep sending messages now back to them, and they're like, uh, this is cool as you say, maybe we should look at that. Yeah, so, I mean, this project took, a, it was like two and a half to three months, so we were going really fast and we weren't thinking about contributing any of it at the time. It was just about getting it done before the end of the summer. Um, so we're, I'm in the process right now of taking those pieces out of some of those monster override modules and breaking them into different specific features. Um, so that's, right now we have the Atrium real name module which is out. Um, and I'm putting them all on the Atrium website which is community.openatrium.org.com. I think I remember. And under here it is the, where's the feature group? Awesome, Zach's already walking this way, so I know we need to talk later. Yeah, so there's, <laughs> shop, there's a shop resources group in Open Atrium. Uh, in community.openatrium.com. And um, so every time we can commit these back, we'll be putting them into the feature directory. Um, making like sub profiles or something like that would be kind of hard because it's a D6 thing and so that makes it more difficult. Um, and so I, I think it's probably better to just make, because these, some of these are features that other organizations, not just as higher ed would want. So it'd be probably better to contribute them as separate features and then at a certain point in time say, here's a, a collection of modules that if you want to do this, you can download them all separately and install them. Yes? Uh, I wondered if you had any problems uh, managing line breaks and paragraph breaks because uh, that's been our trickiest bug to work out with our installation of Atrium. That's a good question, and I didn't go over this, but we actually are using, um, and we use this on uh, our external website as well. Um, so we're using the, actually not the WYSIWYG module, but we're using just the CK editor module, and there's a few reasons for that um, that I won't go into now, um, but basically it gives us, we can do some extra JavaScript stuff to like provide custom formats, et cetera. Um, so we're using a WYSIWYG editor because our users would kill us if we didn't. Um, and we're also using the WYSIWYG um, format module, which lets you do some additional cleanup when, uh, when displaying the pages, and also do things like say, if the alt attribute is missing on an image, don't show it, um, which we don't do in my, but we do do for our external website. 
Um, so the, the WYSIWYG filter module is actually very helpful, especially to clean up any kind of crufty code that a WYSIWYG editor creates. Okay, so you use CK editor in combination with WYSIWYG filter. Correct. Okay, thank you. I've seen this presentation before, but I still want to say congratulations, you guys. Um, connecting to so many administrative systems is a real challenge. I was wondering if you'd consider um, sharing your features on a feature server in an EDU domain in addition to the, the .com domain that you mentioned earlier. I, I think de definitely we could share them on a feature server. We had our own for a while and never just kind of got around to putting stuff there. I think it's still good to have it on D.O D because yeah. that there's still that infrastructure there, the security stuff, um, issues, et cetera. So yeah, I'd be totally open to um, have some of these on a feature server. Some of these modules, actually the Atrium real name module, which is the only one that's publicly available now, is actually not a feature. It's more of a collection of form alter hooks. So uh, I don't know how people would feel about that, but um, yeah, if there was some other central repo, we could definitely okay. work on doing that. Um, the other thing I was gonna ask you about is um, your ARIA roles. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that you're probably using ARIA landmark roles the most? Correct. Guys, have a way to um, have the form landmark um, to incorporate that into Drupal forms because we we're we're also interested in landmark roles, but we haven't done that yet. We're actually just leveraging what um, Ajax Blocks does by default, which is just the, the because the only stuff that we had concern about for accessibility via Ajax was the sort of dynamic block loading. Um, so, you know, we haven't looked at the form stuff just because we're continue to use the kind of core Drupal form, form API stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks again for that presentation. Um, are you, Open Atrium, are there any other natural collaborations that, that your group is working on with other people in this space of open source solutions in Drupal for higher ed? I'm glad, so I don't know if everyone heard, but he was asking if um, we were working on other projects for open source and higher ed. Um, I'm glad you asked. Um, so we're actually in the pro, and we only have a few minutes and I forgot to go over something, so. But uh, um, yes, we're working on three different dr install profiles for higher ed right now. Um, one to track service learning, high impact practice, internship and teacher education, p basically, we call it S4, which is student sign up for service and stuff. Um, and uh, that's a CSU funded project, um, but we're, we are re releasing it um, under GPL. We're also working with Trellin on a student oriented CRM solution to track students for advising purposes and um, uh, to prevent retention problems. Um, and also in the later future, um, a install profile for a content management system for catalog, course catalogs, I should say, because a lot of different people have different catalogs. So course catalog, online schedule, um, and textbook ordering in order to help with HEOA, uh, 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 the HEOA law, so. And those are all at csumb.edu slash Drupal. Sorry, CSU? So it's, uh, csumb.edu slash Drupal. Oh, I'm logged into the CMS. <laughs> Sorry. I love that we have Dolores Huerta on our login page. Okay. Um, hey, I yes. just had a very quick question. So um, I'm curious to know what other systems were you looking at before you started, started decided to go with Open Atrium, and for any other universities that are thinking about using Open Atrium, what would you recommend not to do? So that's uh, a good question. So we did have experience, like I said, with um, UPortal, uh -huh. um, and we couldn't. It just didn't. It didn't go there. Um, and I mean, we did have experience with PeopleSoft, so we kind of knew what we would get if we had chosen to use the PeopleSoft portal, right. um, which we didn't like. Um, so. We, we, there was nothing, we, yeah, we switched to Google Apps, but there was nothing that fit that gap. Um, 
but we never kind of sat down and did a very thorough in, in, uh, uh, investigation of other ones, um, mainly, not mainly, but partially because we work for the state of California and we have no more money. Um, so right. don't send us requests for RFPs because we don't have them. But um, for anybody thinking about using Open Atrium in the future, um, I think the, the, the big challenge is getting some of the UX stuff right. Um, and also, in a lot of other campuses that we've talked to, there are several campuses, sister campuses in the CSU that are wanting to go this route. Um, their biggest challenges is not Open Atrium itself, but in getting their existing enterprise resources to actually talk in a coherent way to other applications. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there is a BOF going on at now, basically, at 2.15 in room 503, and it's specifically on moving open atrium to D7. Um, so I will be there, and I hope you are too. We also have an open atrium users group um, tomorrow at 1045 in room 210. You can see that in the BOF list. Um, and I wasn't using power, uh, PowerPoint, so I couldn't use the slide. But if you, I'd love it if you gave feedback. Um, so the way you can do that is if you go to DrupalCon.org, search for Open Atrium or what have you, find the uh, session and click Provide Feedback. And, and yeah, let's get that started. No. So yeah, and we'll, we'll be around all week and uh, feel free to ask us questions. Thank you.